Hello, Daniel. Thank you so very much for joining us today. It's such a pleasure, Jean-Guy, to be here with you and uh, with all of you listening as well. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to introduce you to uh, the many people joining us today on this Professional Beauty Virtual Week of Beauty. Uh, Daniel, you are a medical doctor, CEO of Super Smart Health, an expert in science and leadership and resiliency, author of Leading Well From Within, a neuroscience and mindfulness-based framework for conscious leadership, and we'll get also into this. You served as founding chair of the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, chairman, co-chairman of the San Diego chapter for conscious capitalism, and you are the co-creator of the wellnessevidence.com with the Global Wellness Institute, where I met you on several global wellness summits around the world. You have been also one of our keynotes in London and also in Dubai, and you have helped leaders, Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, international organizations leverage neuroscience and mindfulness-based skills and practices to better navigate stress, clarify vision and purpose in order to create high-performing teams and thriving cultures to multiply their positive impact on the world. As we are going to get into your insights about the situation and how we can raise, rise from this, I'd like to get into the title of your book, Leading Well From Within. Please explain why this title, especially now in times of stress. Jean-Guy, thank you so much. And uh, again, just it's such a pleasure and a privilege to be here with all of you right now. And particularly, this is a difficult time. I have many, many people are suffering. Uh, and the title of the book is premised on um, if we want to lead well in the world, the first thing is how do we lead well inside ourselves? Fundamentally, how do we dig deep to understand how to effectively navigate stress, uncertainty, self-doubt, and focus on what really matters most? And the work of this is really the science and practice of conscious leadership. And it's so important at this time because for many of us, literally as leaders, it can feel like it, in this time of stress and fear, it can feel like we're losing our mind. So how do we rise up to lead from our higher selves so we can contribute you know, and support all of those around us? So the work of um, conscious leadership draws out of the conscious capitalism space. And if you haven't heard of conscious capitalism, conscious capitalism is essentially a big international organization founded or engaged by you know, companies such as, and I want you to think about the cultures of these companies, Starbucks, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Best Buy, Patagonia, Southwest Airlines, and all of these companies and many, many more have come together and they say, you know, we see organizations as holding the greatest promise for really social transformation. And their mission statement of the organization is ambitious. We exist to elevate humanity. And I don't think there's ever been a time now that we're in struggle of how do we come together and elevate ourselves, come together and elevate through this challenging time. And they run on four tenets. And the first tenant is higher purpose drives, higher purpose drives. Second is making sure that all stakeholders are accounted for. No person or even the environment left behind. And then it's about conscious leadership that drives conscious culture and a thriving environment. So the heart of this is the questions we ask, how can we lead from our higher selves more consciously, particularly in this time of stress and fear? And what I find really, really helpful, particularly in this time of disorientation, is um, anchoring this in a foundation of neurobiology. And the power of neurobiology over here is this. One is, it's actually an act of compassion to understand how our brain works. And the reason for that is when we go into this dark place within ourselves, if you can trust and understand that this is not a flaw or weakness, this is how your brain works under stress. It can destigmatize that and give you great comfort. And then the other piece of this is if you understand that this is not only happening in your brain, but happening in the brains of others, then we don't feel alone and we can actually not only be compassionate with ourselves, but more compassionate with others too. So there are a number of ways of organizing the brain. The simplest, and actually, and it is, perhaps it's even an oversimplification, but very helpful in times 
like this is a construct called the triune brain. It's an evolutionary model of the brain where the brain develops from the bottom up and the back forward. And the three parts of the triune brain over here are first is the brain stem, which some folks would have re referred to as the reptilian brain. Then there's another level up here, which is called the paleomammalian brain in the limbic system. And then you have this third part of the brain, which is the neocortex. And you've got a structure here behind you called the prefrontal cortex. That is the third part of the triune brain. And the powerful thing about the way the brain is constructed is that if we simplify this, the brain essentially maps against Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And when you look at this part of the brain, the reptilian brain, this very much focuses on safety and survival. Safety and survival. So the first primer of the brain, all the flows coming through the senses, through the safety circuits first, which is the strongest part of the brain. Then as we find safety, this part of the brain has many, many functions, including pair bonding and nurturing. And so this gives rise to our capacity for love and belonging. And then this part of the brain, the neocortex and the prefrontal cortex in particular, has a number of important functions that give us the capacity for high performance conscious leadership. This part of the brain, for example, the prefrontal cortex has direct connections over here into the amygdala, which triggers our fight and flight responses. So this part of the brain gives us the capacity for emotional composure. In addition, this part of the brain integrates everything below it. So you have a highway of fibers coming up from gut intelligence, heart intelligence, radiating forward. And this part of the brain gives us the capacity for compassion, morality, empathy. So this part of the brain enables us to relate well to others. In addition, this part of the brain is our executive function. So at a time when we're under immense stress, your ability to access this part of the brain, which gives us decision-making, as well as the willpower to follow through on the decisions we make, is incredibly important for us to stay on track with what really matters most and achieve meaningful results. And then finally, this, this part of the brain has an incredible capacity higher cortical circuits is from the part of the brain to actually engage in something called metacognition where we can step back mindfully and notice the thought streams that are going through. And instead of just reacting, to be able to pause, plan, and make a wise decision. So this part of the brain gives us the capacity to act with wisdom. Now, when you overlay all of this with the stresses we're going through, there are flows that happen naturally in the brain. And there's a very important formula. And the formula that determines how things flow in the brain is the formula of what is the demands we experience in our life to the resources we have to engage. And when demands exceed resources, we experience threat around stress and self-doubt and we can cave under threat going down into a safety zone and really a reactive mindset. Now, that said, this is what the brain is designed to protect itself. Again, we're safety first. So a lot of this is adaptive. So certainly in times of physical threat, it's very, very important that we're taking care here yeah, physically of our physiological needs to prevent you know, coronavirus contagion, to take care of our needs for food and shelter. So all of that is very, very important. But at the same time, when we experience psychological threats, when our ego is rattled, we actually go into fighting and taking flight, you know, for example, against within stress and with self-doubt. So we all fight for control. We all fight to prove self-worth. And while that can occasionally be adaptive, it can also create tremendous strain in our relationships leading to us feeling more irritated and angry or withdrawing from others. So while this can be very adaptive, it can also at times cause more harm than good. Um, actually, Drucker, Peter Drucker, a management guru, has a you know, powerful, the gravitational pull into safety, even at the best of times, is incredibly strong. And Drucker said, essentially, all organizations are a mix of friction, confusion, and low performance speaking to actually this pull down towards safety. And then he says, everything else requires leadership. 
and leaders have the capacity, high performance conscious leaders have the capacity to help in the most difficult times tap into you know, a flow of meaning purpose, to tap into a flow of inspiration, to elevate themselves and others around what matters most. And so essentially high performance conscious leaders have the skills and practices to be able to create within themselves, take better care of themselves, find psychological safety, find a sense of deeper connection within themselves and maintain a focus on really what matters most. And the power of this is, it's not about taking care of yourself, but in taking care of yourself, it enables us to take better care of others. And the power of this is that when we look at what we, how we transform within ourselves, we then have the capacity to transform others because this oscillation between reactivity and creativity doesn't only happen in isolation. It doesn't only happen in isolation. We oscillate all day long between a reactive and a creative mindset. But here's the kicker. There's a powerful definition of leadership that I love, which is leadership is an act of influence. Leadership is an act of influence. And what I've shown over here is that, you know, the neuroscience of conscious leadership invokes this understanding that we're all wired to connect, meaning you cannot not have influence. You cannot not have influence. And so the question we ask is, Am I having positive influence on my environment? And am I having negative influence on my environment? And by the way, we have influence, yes, at work, but at home, with our friends, with our community. We have influence in all dimensions on our, of our life. So leadership's not even a role, it's a way of being. And because we cannot not have influence, the act of leadership development, if you will, is not even an act of becoming a leader. It's an act of awakening to the leader you already are. And so when you look at this wiring to connect, we oscillate between these states of reactivity and creativity. And in the cycle of influence, if we're in a state of reactivity with our fight and flight responses, our fight and flight responses and our edginess and our anger and our frustration trigger somebody else's stress and self-doubt. They go into fight and flight and that triggers their stress and self-doubt. And now you're in a cycle of fight, flight, trigger, fight, flight, trigger, fight, flight, trigger. And by the way, all of those individuals where you're triggering reactivity, they're triggering reactivity in others. So what we're doing is we're not only experiencing physical contagion, we're experiencing social and emotional contagion at a grand scale. On the other hand, if we know how to break the cycle and we know how to enter the state of creating safety, you know, connecting more fully with ourselves and kind of remembering what matters most, we can enter the cycle of being better able to receive and give with others. To receive others with empathy and understanding and give with authenticity and care. What does that look like? It means when you see somebody being edgy with you, giving them more leeway and being able to see the suffering below those reactive responses that's triggering that. So just pause and say, wow, this person's really seems to be stressed out. I wonder what's causing them pain. So you can receive them in a different way, give them concern and they will unwind and you'll actually get into a different kind of relationship. And over here, we come back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We come back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs again. So if you're in fight, flight, trigger, fight, flight, trigger, fight, flight, trigger, we're pulling down towards safety right now. And actually what the consequences of this is if this goes on for weeks, if this goes on for weeks, by the time we pull down into safety, we forego love and belonging and feel disconnected and we forego what gives us a sense of significance so we have a reduced sense of accomplishment. So as this goes on for weeks, we end up feeling exhausted, disconnected with a reduced sense of accomplishment. And that, by the way, is the gold standard definition of burnout. And so over times, and that burnout overlaps with depression. So again, if you begin to feel these embers of burnout right now, even feeling depressed as a result of this. I just want you to know that you're not alone and you're not weak, but this is how the brain responds under essentially high demands and low resources in its endeavor to protect itself when that happens. So it's natural. Now as a leader, the key question for you to ask yourself, because when you look at the equation of demands and resources is, am I showing up for somebody else 
as a demand or am I showing up for them as a resource in terms of how we elevate? Big question, big question. Because if you're showing up as a demand, you're in this cycle over here, as a resource, you'll be in a cycle of receiving and giving with others and will be able to elevate yourself and others. And by the way, there are such beautiful examples going on right now where this is happening. I'm thinking about over here in terms of how people are receiving, giving with each other in Italy, singing from the, singing from the balconies, right? I'm thinking about all of the healthcare providers that are out there doing incredible work, you know, in times of high, high risk because it matters most to them that they want to care for their patients. And the sad thing is that many healthcare providers are getting sick and some are dying as well. So this is just, you know, a testament to the human spirit. So then the question, as you look at this, you might reflect, you know, well, what do we do with all of this? What do we do with all of this insight, this foundation? And so now in terms of shifting, what are the skills and tools for elevation? So the foundational practice for elevation is mindfulness, is mindfulness. That's the foundation of conscious leadership. And so I define mindfulness as a practice of paying attention with a sense of openness, kindness, and curiosity for what's ever rising in the present moment. And so the first part, you know, the first line of this is, what does it mean to lead from your higher selves? And it's an act of elevation. The metaphors that are often used in mindfulness is clouds passing across the sky. And it's like, where do you experience your life? Where do you set your core identity? For many people, we live in the, the changing weather, the, in the clouds, if you will, which are represented by our thoughts, sensations, and emotions. So when you're in the clouds, you're being buffeted around and saying things like, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm anxious. On the other hand, when you have the capacity to elevate yourself into your observing self and enter you know, the clarity of the sky itself to be able to look at the weather, we begin to change our language. We begin to say, oh, I'm noticing that I'm having angry thoughts and feelings. I'm noticing that I'm edgy with my wife and my, or my husband. I'm edgy with my, my kids or my friends. Huh. Do I want to continue this way or do I want to change? So the power of this is as we elevate, as we elevate, what emerges is choice. What emerges is choice. Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, said, between stimulus and response, there's a gap. In this gap is my power to choose. In this gap is my power to choose. And when we orient not only in the power to choose, but we bring qualities as a lens of awareness, the qualities of openness, kindness, and curiosity, such important qualities to bring to this moment. These qualities themselves, as the lenses of our awareness, cultivate a deeper sense of safety, belonging, and significance, particularly when our curiosity pivots to what matters most now. So in, at the foundation, Mindfulness is a practice of elevation that gives us the capacity, moment by moment, to notice and choose. So it comes down to this, mindfulness is the power to notice and choose. And when you talk about conscious leadership, this is a moment to moment experience, which is you catch yourself and in that openness, kindness, extending kindness, if you're noticing suffering in yourself and others, and then saying what? best serves next is a very powerful orientation right now to actually get through these challenging times. In addition, I wanted to provide on the foundation of conscious leadership, I wanted to provide you with some key steps that help you shift between a reactive and a creative mindset in the heat of the moment. And the four and four framework is a framework, it's called the four and four framework because there are four steps and four components in each step. So these are four steps, and certainly I'm good, just going to give you a taste. If you really are interested, I encourage you to, to read Leading Well From Within. I've got the depth of all of this um, in the book. So first step is the reactivity element. You cannot effectively manage your reactivity unless you can recognize it first. So the first step over here is to be able to recognize, first of all, your reactive sensations, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and then ask yourself a question which is in this moment, is this doing me and others more harm than good? If so, these are the four components over here where we can take the edge of our reactivity. It's almost like popping a balloon. So the first piece of this is, if we're feeling reactive, remember, the, in the brain, 
this base of the brain is fast, reactive, slow, wise. So the first piece is just to pause, just to pause, to allow you pause with openness, kindness, and curiosity to allow your wise brain to come back online. Next step is to breathe, to breathe. And we gain access. You know, when we get very stressed out, we are stepping on the gas, the sympathetic nervous system into fight and flight. There's another part of the um, automatic or autonomic nervous system where you tap the brake, you tap the brake. And this is the parasympathetic nervous system and you get access to this through your out breath. So just breathing with a soft belly, di it's called diaphragmatic breathing when you let your belly go soft and you actually access it through your out breath. So what this looks like is four seconds in, say, and then you breathe out even slower. And look, you, you purse, you purse your lips a little bit to put a little bit more pressure around the exhalation. I encourage you to try that. Three to six breaths will really calm you down, you know, in a hurry. Third component over here, and you can use this in any order that you want to. Third element is something called name entertainment. So um, there are studies that were done um, uh, with, uh, out of UCLA where they put in, uh, individuals in MRI scanners and when people looked at angry faces, it activated their amygdala, the uh, source of a, you know, triggered the anxiety response. And what they found is if you simply name your experience, ah, there's anger, there's frustration, there's irritation, that activated the prefrontal cortex and deactivated the amygdala within seconds. So there's this ad adage, you name it, you tame it. And then finally, the final component here is consider your best response. And then ask yourself what best serves next. So this first step is powerful. You know, our ability to take the edge of the reactivity in the heat of the moment. This next step goes deeper. So you can take the edge of your reactivity, but sometimes the reactivity comes back over and over again. This step enables you to reframe your experience with stress and self-doubt. And it's incredible, it's almost like you're going into the roots and you're actually going in and you're reframing the underlying, the underlying triggers that are causing those reactive responses to begin with. So in terms of reframing your experience with stress, as you consider this, ask yourself, for me, is stress a demand or a resource? And in, at this time, for many people, many people are actually experiencing stress as a demand. It feels overwhelming. And I want to show you the power of actually um, understanding that it can be both. And this gets into an understanding of you know, the new science of stress, which reveals that we don't only have one stress response, we have multiple types of stress response, and three of the core ones map to different um, levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So here's the threat response. The threat response is... Um, you know, this is our fight and flight responses, and it's designed perfectly to save our life in short term. Um, and the physiology of this is, you know, our blood vessels constrict and we release cortisol. So in the short term, all of that's very adaptive to physical survival. But in the long term, it can strain our relationships, cause us, you know, sleepless nights, and this can really impact, you know, our health. It actually can, over time, it can suppress our immune system. So in this time where we're looking to, to protect our immune systems, this can degrade it. Next, at the next level is the tendon befriend response. So when we get stressed, we don't only release cortisol, we also release oxytocin, the cuddle chemical. And so there's a part of you, the way we experience this is there's a part of us that wants to isolate or get aggressive, but there's another part of us that wants to call a friend seeking or giving emotional support. And so the question is, which stream do you swim in? The tendon befriend response is our inclination to reach out for social connection. And then we've got this response, which is a high performance stress response. This response is extraordinary. And this response is based on when we feel the energy of stress and we amped up, instead of trying to kind of push that energy down, we're using every ounce of that stress energy in service of the outcomes that matter most. And when we do that, something different happens in our body. Instead of constricting, our blood vessels dilate. We get more blood to the brain. We release different neurochemistry in the brain that actually activates it even more effectively. And so the power of this, the research shows all kinds of high performance outcomes, business negotiations, academic achievement, athletic performance, um, even planes landing, you know, pilots landing planes in flight simulations, 
engine failure in really dramatic turbulence, and we're in turbulent times right now, you know, it's a high performance, high performance stress response. So you may be asking, how, do, how could we convert threat more to challenge in terms of that response? And so this brings us back to this formula that I alluded to earlier on. And that is, it really comes down to this relationship between demands and resources. And when the demands exceed our resources, we will tend to cave under threat. We'll go down into that safety frame. And the demands, you know, are incredibly high right now. On the background of pre-existing demands that we had, the coronavirus disease has now got a whole nother layer of demand creating incredible disorientation and disruption. And it's really straining our resources. So for many of us, we've tipped. We've tipped into this threat response. And that's completely understandable. On the other hand, if we can actually create a, a state, an internal state, where our resources exceed our demands, we can rise to the challenge. So this is a time of incredible opportunity for learning and growth. You know, we, we, many of us are spending a fair amount of time, you know, at home now, you know, where we have time for reflection. And this is the time to think, to really, you know, leverage time, you know, what is this incredible time for learning in terms of how do we become as leaders more internally resourceful? And a lot of that's mindset transformation in terms of what we're, what we're sharing of here. How do I become more internally resourceful to find new ways of actually being more, feeling more deeply safe, connected, and really kind of committed to what matters most. In other words, how do I heal or grow or take care of myself, others, my family, my clients, and the communities I serve? So tapping into those internal well of resources and then marshalling you know, your community. So we marshal external resources and then the systems, much, much of where uh, are moving now online. How do we marshal all this so we can actually begin to gather resources to actually rise um, and meet these challenges. Now, when it comes to stress itself, when it comes to stress itself, for many people experience stress as a demand itself. So what would happen if we could move the stress itself from the demand side of the equation to the resource side of, of the equation? So how do we do this? And you know, what's really exciting about this part of the research is that there are researchers at Stanford that share that this is easier than you imagine. And what they share is that our relationship with stress is guided by our definition of it. And so most people, this is the definition of stress based on how stress has been defined in healthcare is that stress is, can I handle it or can I cope? So I'd encourage you to think about, um, you know, how you relate to that definition of stress. Because if that's how we experience stress, when we feel stressed, we're kind of left with, geez, I can't cope. I can't cope. So when we get stressed, the feeling is not strength, but the feeling is, wow, I can't cope. So I'm feeling weak. So what happens is not only do you get stressed, but we get stressed about being stressed. So the researchers at Stanford show that when you change your definition of stress, you change the game. You change the game. And these the researchers are Kelly McGonigal, Alia Kramitz, Stanford, they offer this definition, powerful definition, stress is what arises when something you care about is at stake. Incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful, because what that means, what that means is when you get stressed, you don't get stressed because you're weak. You get stressed because you care. You get stressed because you care. And an interesting thing happens when you actually leverage this definition and understanding you enter the challenge response and literally your blood vessels dilate and you get into that high performance physiological response. So remembering in this time of stress, you're not stressed because you're weak, you're stressed because you care. And think about how much you care about, about your families, your friends, your health, your communities, your business, this all matters. And so what I've done is I've created a, these four components in the step over here, which is how do we leverage the energy of stress to focus on what really matters most? And the mnemonic over here is let's get real with stress. And so the first component is to be able to recognize it. And then in recognizing it, 
rather than recoiling against the stress to remember that stress is mobilizing as an ally, as a friend to help you take care of the outcomes that matter most. So this leads you into an embrace. And then we go into this third component of here, which is how do we ask a better question? And typically under stress, we ask the question, how can I get rid of my stress? Where the answer comes back, second bottle of Chardonnay, or more sadly, um, how can I become more indifferent around what I really care about? A better question is, what is it that I care about? What do I truly, what truly matters now? And how can I take the smallest steps in alignment with what matters now? And then the fourth component of this is to be able to leverage the energy of that stress in service of what really matters most. So these first two steps are powerful. Step one enables you to recognize and manage your reactivity. Take the edge of the reactivity in the heat of the moment. Over here, step two helps you reframe the underlying triggers of stress and self-doubt that are driving those reactive responses to begin with. So this gives us stress mastery to navigate through stress. And now we begin to look more fully at what are we, what are we navigating towards? And this gets us into the realm of being able to cultivate a creative mindset, cultivate creativity by reflecting what really matters. And now we're getting to the world of positive psychology. And this gets into the recipe for the flourishing life. And really, you know, if you think about what really energizes our life, it's the thrill of learning, connecting, you know, connecting over here with ourselves, with others, our deeper source of inspiration, having the ability to express our full potential and then be of service. Out of, and then having the ability to create the freedom and opportunity to, to live this, out of which comes an experience of significance and our ability to leave a legacy. And so we don't have time to really kind of go into the depths of it, but I wanted to just show you that there is a, I have a four component process over here that helps you do just that, to be able to, design, to, be able to create the freedom and opportunity to live all this. And it's a process, the four component process is vision, strategy, implementation, and results. And it's a cycle of continuous quality improvement that helps you optimize your health, your relationships, and the meaning, joy, significance, and effectiveness, and meaning in your work. And again, all of that's laid out in, um, in my book as well. So these first three steps, these first two steps over here are around um, navigating stress and focus on what really matters most. The most important part of this work is step four, which is the ability to tap into our stream of inspiration, into our stream of inspiration and become really purposefully engaged. And this is the deepest part of the work because ultimately what drives, what drives our responses, whether it be reactivity or creativity, is the internal dialogue that's chirping at us all day long. And under stress, what is really kind of chitter chatter, what's chirping at us is, okay, in this moment, what if and all the catastrophes that could happen? Okay, um, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with everybody else? And ultimately we start chirping on this and it drags us down into this place of, you know, maladaptive safety, if you will, with fight and flight responses. And that becomes the fabric, essentially that leaches into not our internal conversation, then leaks into our external conversation. And that then becomes fight, flight, trigger, the cycle of reactivity that leaches into culture. So the question over here is, can we ask a better question? How do we transform our internal dialogue for a more productive dialogue? And so this is the process of catalyzing growth which is your ability to ask a good question, to then find the stillness for those answers to find you, to be able to trust your knowing, and then take action in the stream of that inspiration. And when you bring this back here and look at the powerful questions we ask, we put ourselves into here, yeah, into this stream of inspiration to be able to reframe your questions or recede your questions, to become, come up with more productive questions, such as questions in alignment with your recipe for your flourishing life here, asking the question like, okay, difficult moment. 
What did I have to learn? Capitalizing your learning and growth at this time. What did I have to learn? How can I better connect within myself? How can I better connect with others? How can I better connect with my deeper source of inspiration? How can I best express my full potential? How can I best be of service right now? When we begin to enter into these questions, we begin to cultivate a deeper sense of safety, belonging, and significance to lead within ourselves from our higher selves. And then we begin to see those same questions in our teams, in our families, we begin to rise together. Agreed. This is a great framework for you as a coach, uh, helping leaders, helping organizations. I know you have one-on-ones, but also you've taken this framework to uh, uh, audiences of hundreds of people and leading them for, for a whole day or two days of seminars. So this is really good and, and, and efficient for you as a coach helping others. But I also hear, as you say, reframing questions for us. So could you lead us a little bit more into how we can coach ourselves in this time of isolation? And with that practice, how can we coach others with, with, with whom we're in contact? Well, thank you for that question, Jean-Guy, because it's a really, I think at this time, probably one of the most important things we have to ask as leaders is that question. How can we better coach ourselves and how can we better coach others so that we can all elevate together? And, um, and this work really, I want, just want to um, amplify, it comes down to the quality of questions that we're asking. It comes down to the quality of questions that we're asking. And so when we look at, you know, how do we coach um, individuals up? Well, let me share with you as well, how I coach others so that you can actually use the same process to be able to do that. And so Thank you. when I, with pleasure. And so when I coach, Others, you know, usually I coach on, on a six month block. Um, you know, every other week we have, you know, this, these sessions that are arced on, you know, you know, how do we lead well from within and become more effective and high performance conscious leaders. But the key, the part of this that actually is the most important part of uh, the way I work is I'm on call for my clients 24 seven. And I want them to call me in a moment of need. And the philosophy of the coaching is one of self coaching. So I want them to call me in a moment of crisis. In other words, when the demands have exceeded their resources to engage in the heat of the moment, and in that moment, I know they're going to be calling me in, in the depth of safety. And so my job, and initially, interestingly enough, they're calling me because their prefrontal cortex is offline and they don't have access to the circuits of love and belonging or clear decision-making in the circuits of significance. And so they're, they're offline right now and they're calling me as a peripheral prefrontal cortex so they could resource up to you know, rise to that level of significance. That said, because the philosophy of coaching is one of self-coaching, my goal as a coach is to actually help somebody self-coach by helping their prefrontal cortex come back online. And this is the way I do it. So the first thing I do, and this is so important for each of you as you do this, is to claim the ground of belonging first, love and belonging first. That's absolutely key. So to give people the space, because sometimes we try to come and say, let me, let me fix this for you. That really undercuts it. You've got to claim the ground of belonging first. And so we listen, we, you know, you, know, you can set a time on this, three, four, five minutes. I just listen. I just listen with heartfelt empathy and compassion, with heartfelt empathy and compassion. And as somebody tells their story, what happens is they're all doing it essentially a large name entertainment, if you will. Instead of being in their story, they're above the story. And when we hold that with compassion, the stress level comes down. They begin to get perspective over their story and you can feel this change, almost this change in temperature in the interaction. And at that point, as I've heard, so how are you feeling now? And they'll say something like, whew, I feel like I have a weight lifted off my shoulders. And then and only then will I actually begin to elevate to the realm of significance because I've claimed the ground of belonging with powerful questions to be able to elevate, help them elevate their reflection and thinking. And this, these questions are premised on the work of appreciative inquiry. And it's a very, very well traveled track. And so there are six foundational questions that you can use in any order. And so the first question, 
once we've actually gotten this place of, you know, greater, you know, ease and calm, and now you're opening up your circuits, the first question is, what matters most and why? Particularly over here in this time, what matters most to you and why? We're anchoring over here to purpose. We're anchoring over here to purpose. And in a time of difficulty where people maybe feel lost, they may feel scared, they may have answers like, okay, what matters most to me? Okay, hmm. you know, how can I better take care of myself? And how can I better take care of my family or my clients? And how can I grow to be more resilient? You know, and then you might say, well, and why does that matter to you? And people will anchor deeply into kind of like why that matters to them, their family, their communities, and even the world at large. So you're anchoring right now on purpose, and that's elevating you into your prefrontal cortex. And then this next step is incredibly powerful. What this process presumes is capacity. So I don't give an answer. You say, this matters most to me, so let me tell you what. I help people activate their own strengths by helping them remind them of a time when they've already got through this so that they own their response. And I presume capacity. And so I'll ask a question such as, huh, well, where else have you been up against it before? Where you've been faced with seemingly insurmountable odds and somehow you came through. Share a story. And as they share a story, they begin to remember the strength that they have and the energy begins to rise in their body. And then I ask the next question, well, what does that reveal to you about your current strengths? What does that reveal to you about your current strengths? And what are those current strengths and what are the superpowers that got you through before that can really help you now? And they begin to really kind of access those superpowers and energize, say, wow, you know, I, you know, found that I had incredible, you know, I was able to tap into my mindfulness practice or I was able to tap into that positivity or my capacity for resilience and grit. And I was able to tap that. They reconnect with that. Or, you know, they say, you know, for me, the greatest gift was actually remembering to be self-compassionate so I could be compassionate with others. Huh. Well, if those strengths, if you can imagine those strengths flourishing right now, if you can imagine those strengths flourishing right now, what would your vision for near-term and long-term success look like? And then the next two questions go into strategic implementation. Like what strategies will best enable your success? And what action steps would you take to achieve your results? So what will you implement to make this happen? And so the short of this is it's, this process is so incredibly powerful for both one-on-one -on -one coaching, but also to be able to engage in this process at a team level that can really help us all rise together. Indeed. Speaking of others, how, how can people work with you? How can we reach out to you for future guidance? Yeah, with pleasure, jean -Guy. So certainly I work in a number of different ways. One is um, if as a leader, um, you feel you would at this very challenging time would benefit from uh, some aspect of coaching to help you elevate yourself so you can elevate others around you, I'd, I'd be very, very happy to connect. I also work with teams. So as a leader, if you want to help your teams not only um, self-coach themselves, but understand to how they can help their teams self-coach themselves so teams can work more effectively in these challenging times, you know, I'm happy to help there as well. And, you know, finally, the, the nature of the workshops, um, more and more, um, uh, we're all turning uh, uh, to do this uh, work online. And what I'm finding, particularly over Zoom, it's incredibly powerful where you have breakout rooms where you can really simulate an experience as richly as if you were in um, a uh, live workshop. And so I do a lot of programs right now, um, supporting people in the virtual environment, really activating around the insights of leading well from within and the ability to coach themselves and coach others so we can all rise together and in the you know, the language of um, uh, conscious capitalism, um, you know, fulfill the mission of elevating ourselves. So ultimately we can elevate all those around us and humanity at large. Thank you so very much, Daniel. I know um, people can reach out to you directly. Uh, there you have a slide with your contact details and I highly encourage um, leaders listening to us, um, 
spa owners and, and hospitality leaders to get in touch with you, definitely get the book. Um, go on the website, supersmarthealth.com to see all the many other resources. And if you um, need it, please absolutely reach out to Daniel on his email or by telephone. Thank you so very much, Daniel, for your time. There's so much more we could uh, dive in, and I hope we will have more conversations like this. Okay. Thank you, jean -Guy. Thank you so much you know, for all the work that you're doing, and thank you all for listening. I hope this has served you well.